Okay, so as you probably already know, this presentation is on peer assessment plus one thinking and noticing approaches to genre writing. The subtopic is a brief history of writing education and its implications for the future of writing education. My name is Carla Shepard. I have a, a master's in applied linguistics and ESL from Georgia State University. I currently work in South Korea at a university called Usong. And um, if you would like to comment on anything or talk about things like having this presentation sent to you, you can contact me at my first name, last name, Carla Shepard at Usong, W-O-O-S-O-N-G dot work. Here's the presentation outline. I will start with a brief timeline of writing education, and then I will get to the crux of the topic. Then we will talk about statistics on paper recycling. Uh, part four will be my personal experiences in a paperless classroom during the COVID-19 era. Part five will have a paperless classroom governed by uh, these policies. And um, lastly, we will talk about the benefits of a paperless classroom and future writing implications. All right, so timeline of writing education. Uh, Western writing education in the 19th century and the invention of word processing technology. All right, so here is what a writing space looks like. Okay, um, one second, sorry about that. So back in the 19th century, this is a typical writing space. There were desks and blackboards. There was an imitation of standards, meaning that the students were expected to basically copy everything that the teacher did. The room fostered respect and order. They maintained proper discipline through punishment. Okay, and sorry about this thing. I might have to it should go away in a second. Okay, so the typical form of punishment. Uh, as you see in each picture, you see a child uh, wearing a conical shaped hat. It's called a dunce hat. So as a form of discipline, the students had to wear this hat and they would stand in the corner of the room or something like that. Um, a dunce is a person considered incapable of learning. Dunces are often comedically shown wearing paper cone hats, known as dunce hats, hat, excuse me, known as dunce caps with the word dunce or dumb, or simply a capital D on them. School children were sometimes compelled to wear a dunce cap and to stand or sit on a stool in the corner as a form of punishment for misbehaving or failing to demonstrate that they had properly performed their studies. So here is a typical writing surface from that period of time. A slates were commonly used in schools in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. They were affordable and durable. By 1809, some public schools were using blackboards, which was a grouping of slates by 1840, blackboards and slates were manufactured commercially. Sometimes the two slates were bound together to open like a book and increase the writing space. After the Civil War, pencils appeared and the cost of paper decreased and became inexpensive. Writing became more prominent in schools after that. Okay, so here are typical writing utensils from this period of time. You have slate pencils, quill pens, ink wells, a dip pen, and on the far right hand side, uh, an ballpoint pen. 
Okay, during this period of time, uh, penmanship was considered a type of um, a sign of privilege. Okay, so writing was an art form. There were many different styles and rules developed for good penmanship. Clerks were expected, excuse me, clerks were expected to learn the penmanship style of their employers. As I said earlier, good penmanship was a mark of privilege. Traditional English round hand was common. So uh, at the top right, you have an example of English round hand. And then you had a Spencerian followed because it was more practical. So it was better for business and personal letters. And this is what Spencerian uh, penmanship looks like on the bottom right. Okay, so now we have penmanship manuals and changing writing preferences. Okay, so we also had penmanship manuals. These are the manuals that were used to teach these different styles of writing. Okay, so one system was the eclectic system of penmanship 1867. They thought that learning complex letter strokes instead of beginning with letters and words was hindering learning. Okay. And then you had Merrill's modern penmanship, which compartmentalized different scripts into formal and informal styles. With this system, writing became accessible and because of that, uh, literacy increased. Okay. All right, so next we have the invention of word processing technology. So automation and early word processing technology. On the right hand side, we have a 19th century Remington typewriter. Okay, Remington is the manufacturer of um, firearms. They also make typewriters, okay. So printing and movable type were invented in the Middle Ages. Typewriters were invented in 1714 by Henry Mill. It was the first significant advancement for personal writing. The corporate world became more productive. The portable models were first marketed in the early 1900s. The first workable electric model was produced in the 1920s. The IBM Electromatic was introduced in 1930 and it greatly increased typing speeds. It was followed by the M. Schultz Company's typewriter, which could store information for later retrieval and produce multiples. So let's uh, continue the automation and early word processing technology. Next came the flexor writer. It used paper tape and mistakes could be deleted. In 1961, IBM created the Selectric typewriter, which used a revolving type ball and was faster. In 1964, IBM created the magnetic tape Selectric typewriter, which combined the Selectric with magnetic tape and a reusable storage medium. This marked the beginning of word processing technology. In 1969, IBM magnetic cards were used for recording. In 1972, Lexitron and Linolex introduced video display screens. In the 70s, IBM created the floppy disk. In 73, Bidec created a word processing system with a floppy disk, which brought the ability for typing instructions to be input into the software. Okay, so let's move on to the crux of the topic, which is that word processing technology has existed for approximately six decades, yet still hasn't reached its full potential and how it can positively impact our environment and education. All right, so over 200 years later, not yet, not much has changed. Okay, so on the 
Left hand side, you have Charles Dickens using a quill pen to write on paper. And on the right hand side, you still have the same basic um, mechanical tool used to put things on a paper as a form to um, capture writing. Okay. Well, okay, a few things have changed. Instructors are no longer allowed to discipline children. Uh, for the most part, especially not in a way like this. That would be very, very controversial if that were done anymore. Okay, that's a little joke. All right, so part three, statistics on paper recycling. We will look at A, solid municipal waste and paper and paperboard, B, the amount that paper actually contributes to environmental pollution, and C, the current world leaders in recycling. Okay, so this is what compacted paper and paperboard waste looks like. Okay, from mass manufacturing to the landfill. From the introduction of the printing press to the mechanization of wood harvesting, the cost of paper became inexpensive and affordable. As a result, the level of consumption increased, which led to increased paper waste. Okay, so uh, this is the, sorry, hold on a second. This is a 2018 United States paper and paper board to solid municipal waste data. So 292 million tons of solid municipal waste uh, in the United States in 2018. As you can see about um, one quarter of the solid municipal waste is made up of paper and paperboard. Okay. This is the most current data available by the Environmental Protection Agency that I could find on the internet. Okay. All right. So of the paper and paperboard management in uh, 2018, uh, some of it was uh, combusted, the large majority was recycled, and the rest of it was landfilled. Okay, and here are the current world leaders in recycling. Here's Korea, and then we have Germany and Switzerland. So now we were go are going to look at my personal experiences in a paperless classroom during the COVID-19 era. We will look at what happened, how it went, what I learned, et cetera. We will look at examples of what I did, and we will talk about pedagogical implications and strategies. Okay, so prior to the semester of spring 2020, I had taught writing a completely different way. The process went something like this. Step one, I would present a one paragraph essay writing style and student would write uh, a one paragraph essay. Step two, then I would grade the one paragraph essay writing and the students would rewrite the one paragraph essay based on the feedback that I gave them. Step three, the students would repeat steps one and two until the midterm and again until the final, okay? This process involved lots of paper and the passing back and forth of it between students and I. This often caused delays because some students were forgetful, but it also wasn't practical because students often didn't pick up on the concepts of paragraph building until the very end, if at all. In hindsight, this is due to a variety of reasons, which will be addressed later on. During the semester of 2020, I began to use the word processing program called Google Docs, and the changes in the student outcomes were significantly higher. So here were my goals for the writing course spring 2020. Students will be able to acquire basic one paragraph essay structure. Students will be able to recognize the different essay parts. Students will be able to use transition words and signal words effectively. Students will be encouraged to bring writing portfolio to completion. 
and students will be able to learn Google Docs for collaboration, peer input, and feedback from peers and instructor. Okay, so what did I do differently? Well, this is what I did spring 2020. Uh, what is Google Docs? I think everyone knows what Google Docs is here. Okay, so it's a free web-based word processor. It's included as part of the Google Docs editor suite offered by Google. The other programs include Google Sheets, Google Slides, Google Drawings, Google Forms, Google Sites, and Google Keep. Okay, so this is what I used. Uh, what can you do with Google Docs in the classroom? You can do live collaboration between students and instructor or between students. You can track student contributions. You can share links. You can allow students to edit shareable documents and you can create documents. The ability to compartmentalize, share and edit documents in real time would prove to be tremendously valuable to our course. Okay, so let's look at how it was done. So a Google Doc was created with the four main essay requirements for the semester. Because they are simultaneously learning process writing, each stage of the essay was included in the document as well. We will look at this shortly. The stages were research, plan, first draft, and final draft. To accompany the Google Doc for the essay writing, there was a peer assessment sheet for student feedback, which included a checklist. The checklist for feedback should include structural and grammatical points that can be changed to suit your needs that the instructor wishes to cover during the course of the semester. The Google Docs was the practice and production portion of the presentation practice production PPP model. The presentation practice production model is straightforward. First, the instructor presents the target forms to be learned. Then the students practice the content. Finally, the students are responsible for producing the content. Okay. Okay, so let's look at uh, the examples. This Google Doc over here is the portfolio, and this over here is the peer assessment. So let's start with the portfolio. Okay, if you can't see something, please let me know. I'm assuming the screen is still sharing. Okay, so um, sometimes I include instructions in my students' mother tongue in order to motivate them. Uh, so that's what you see here. So here is the writing portfolio with the four pieces. It can be organized really nicely as you can see, and you can just click on the portfolio piece that you need to see um, if you uh, title the pieces. Okay, so it's there. they put their course number here, their name and their student number, and then they're reminded right here up at the top that it has each portfolio piece has four different parts. It has a research, brainstorming or mind map and a rough draft and a final submission for the research portion of the portfolio the students uh, look up websites or images anything that comes to mind uh, that can help uh, give them more ideas about um, whatever it is they're talking about they have to write about and then the brainstorming the mind map the students just make a plan you can do like, um, there are many different types of brainstormings. You can, uh, types of brainstorming that you can do. You can do a Venn diagram. You can do a mind map. Um, just, just anything really just to get them to uh, generate a, as much uh, 
new content or content related to the topic that they can. After they do that, they're responsible for a rough draft. That's part three. Okay, so let's move to portfolio piece one. So there's the space for step one, the research. Okay, and um, there's step two, the space for the brainstorming. Okay, and here's step three. After the students finish step three, they are put into pairs, okay? So after they're put into a pair, they go into the Google Drive folder that I've made for them for the class and they look for their partner's portfolio and they open their partner's portfolio. After they open their partner's portfolio, they come to uh, the peer assessment folder. Okay, and the peer assessment folder is designed to look like the portfolio in order to eliminate as much confusion as possible. Before the students peer assess each other, we do some practice assessments down here, practice number one and practice number two. Okay, so they practice first before they actually assess their peers. Um, so each portfolio piece has a corresponding assessment checklist. Okay, I teach very, very basic writing. So the things that I'm looking for are very basic, but when the writing is very basic, um, students still try to get away with not doing things uh, in an orderly <laughs> manner if you're not looking for it or they think you won't look for it. So this, this is extremely helpful. Uh, as I was saying earlier, this can be uh, customized for whatever your needs are uh, for writing, or listening and speaking, whatever. You, you could use this for so many different applications. But anyway, so the first part, it contains the formatting things that they're responsible for. Okay, so for example, is the essay eight to 10 lines long? Two, is there a title in the center of the page? Three, is there an introduction with a topic sentence? Four, is the paragraph indented? Five, is the paragraph written continuously? Okay, six, does a body of the essay include transition words? And seven, is there a conclusion with an opinion? Okay, so their partner comes and they read, they read their partner's essay. Okay, so this is also important. They put um, the name of the person uh, whose portfolio, could you turn this down off please? The owner of the portfolio puts their name here their partner puts their name here and they can answer yes, no, or partial, okay? We also had one portfolio assignment that wasn't necessarily a, a writing, it was a, a leaflet, so that's what this uh, column is on the far right, okay? And then you have um, the grammar vocabulary points that you're looking for, okay? So I looked for um, capitalization, are the beginning of sentences capitalized? Are sentences ended with a period? Are there at least four adjectives? Do sentences start with and or but? And do you sense a plan for the assignment? Okay, so this is what the peer assessment portion of the a portfolio component looks like. Okay, so the first couple times or for each of the um, peer assessments, you can monitor the students and make sure that they are being responsible about um, assessing each other um, until you feel that you don't need to do that anymore if you ever get to that point. But okay, so this is what that looks like.
All right, so let's go back to the presentation. So let's go over the teaching methodologies and the theoretical underpinnings, okay? Um, so what we just looked at are collaborative learning and peer assessment, okay? We will look at um, the noticing hypothesis and plus one thinking later on. Actually, the noticing um, actually happens due to there being a checklist. So if a student tries to skip it consciously or subconsciously, the noticing will bring it back into their awareness and, and make sure that they've um, paid mind to it, okay? Okay, so collaborative learning. This happens when two or more people attempt to learn something together. Because this work is not done independently, students are able to capitalize on each other's resources and skills. The benefit, you have increased audience awareness, motivation, and willingness to make revision. And then you have peer assessment. This happens when students work in pairs or small groups to give each other feedback on their work. The language learning theories involved are social interaction and cooperative learning. The benefits, it encourages students to become responsible and accountable for their own learning rather than leaving everything to the teacher. Students are more likely to give each other valuable feedback on written texts. Additionally, it gives students the opportunity to engage in constructive and less intimidating talk about their work lastly it gives students a chance to receive feedback from real audiences okay so collaborative learning peer assessment now let's look at noticing the noticing hypothesis this is a theory in second language acquisition that cites that learners must consciously notice the grammatical form of input in order to grasp and understand the grammatical form of the input According to Schmidt 2010, a learner must attend to and notice linguistic, excuse me, a learner must attend to and notice linguistic features of the input that they are exposed to if those forms are to become intake for learning. And then the benefit, students are confronted with the language forms, in this case, with incorrect examples, I will show you this in a minute. Uh, with incorrect examples, one paragraph essay structure, the items on the checklist, and the different stages of the process writing. Okay. This increases learner outcomes because of the heightened level of awareness of the forms and the required tasks, especially when comparing their work to the work of their classmates. So comparison uh, is also extracted from this noticing. So when you have all of your students work in an open folder online, some students uh, who are very competitive or even some students are, who are very shy can, when they're feeling lost or curious, look at the work of their peers. And that also provides um, some noticing as well as additional input for them to improve their work. Okay, and we have plus one thinking. This means that for every interaction between a learner and something, the instructor, the material, another learner or something else, an additional option is provided. Okay, in this particular case, the plus one was introduced in the presentation phase as the most advanced paragraph form in terms of the grammar used. So we will look at uh, this plus one thinking again. When I was teaching the different uh, parts of the essay, I included an easy essay, a sort of intermediate level essay, and a more advanced essay. Uh, in order to get the students to have additional input as a plus one, and I also included an essay as an example of what not to do, okay? And that was very helpful in eliminating 
um, some sort of intellectual liberty in terms of how the students uh, 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 interpreted how they should uh, perform the task. Okay. So that was really helpful. Incorrect examples of what not to do can be extremely helpful. Um, okay, so this was due to there being uh, multiple. So also I had multiple levels. If you're teaching multiple levels, um, it's also helpful. It eliminates the amount of lesson planning that you have to do um so there are multiple benefits to the plus one thinking so additional input uh, for learners plus one thinking uh, so the benefit additional input for students a level higher as well as helping to reduce the amount of materials needed to be created for courses okay so there's a little bit more uh, to encourage students to notice the input Input enhancing techniques such as color coding are used to highlight the important structural components of the essay. Okay, so another noticing strategy that was used was input enhancement. So I will show you in an, a minute um, color coding that I used to highlight the different um, structural components of the essay. Okay, so Again, uh, the students compare the essays. There are two acceptable essays, one which is a beginner level and one which is more advanced. The third essay is an incorrect example of what not to do. As well as comparing the previously mentioned items, the students are able to compare the different essay genres. So, for example, what a comparative essay looks like versus a persuasive essay versus a process essay. Okay, so um, I also introduced different essay types as part of the noticing. Um, presentation on um, paragraph structure, paragraph type. Lastly, during the peer review stages, the students compare their work with each other and against a checklist. The plus one component of the essays is the inclusion of the more advanced of the essays which provides additional input by encouraging students to use more advanced forms. Okay. It is also hoped that this will increase the motivation of the students to excel. Okay. Moreover, the students provide each other with additional input via their portfolio work, which is shared via an open format. Okay, so let's look at um, this noticing in plus one. I always start with a very, very simple essay. I encourage my students to work simply and be accurate rather than do something overly complex and do it incorrectly. Um, so I don't mind if students like literally, and it's kind of a joke to lighten up the, the mood, okay? Why cats are better than dogs, okay? So that's example one. Okay, this is just a basic essay. They, they look at all of these essays at the same time. And then essay two is a comparison. Okay, so, and this is a, a bit more complex. Okay, the comparison of the Western Raven and the Bald Eagle. Okay, so the differences and the similarities between the Bald Eagle and the Western Raven, okay. And then essay three. All right, you'd be surprised. I used to get essays that look like this, okay? So as you can see, it's not formatted. It's not written continuously. There's no indent, okay? Mostly I think it's due to the fact that students are copying and pasting. It's also due to the fact that they're not motivated and not trying. But if you show them an example of what you know that they shouldn't be doing, uh, you can make them notice the incorrect um, uh, 
a product, okay? Right, and oftentimes I, I find that an essay example, additional input, noticing that's a bit more complex than they're ready for, it's still additional input. And um, some students can try it and they will be successful at uh, copying a more advanced essay type. Okay, so um, moving on as part of this uh, presentation, I've included input enhancement for noticing. Okay, so here are the three essay parts. This, the three um, structural essay parts. So uh, this introduction is in green and then the body is in yellow and then the conclusion is in blue. Okay, then you can get them to identify each part, green, yellow, blue. Okay, I find color coding to be extremely effective to help with noticing. Okay, and again, uh, here's more color coding. These are our transition words, okay, and signal phrases. So what's the blue? What's the green? Noticing. Okay. All right. So back to the presentation. So let's look at a classroom that was governed by a paperless policy. So this is Sean Feld and My Shirt Tall, 2017. Their rationale of learning in a paperless classroom was preparing students for the future, two, making learning more efficient, and three, empowering other students. Okay, the primary rationale for the paperless classroom is to promote a more efficient and organized classroom while preparing students for the practical world outside school walls. Each student used a laptop as a replacement for books and notebooks and managed his or her learning assignments with their laptop, which was part of their personal school equipment. Handwriting and reading from paper were rare. Okay, so they used five different instructional methods. First with media enriched learning. This is integrating online video and prepared recorded lessons. They used adaptive learning, which is personalized learning and individual learning, especially for students with special needs. Group learning was used also, which is collaborative learning as well as individual learning in their classes. In the teacher's opinion, collaborative learning enabled higher order thinking and gave students a sense of knowledge of the material. Additionally, it encouraged them to explore multiple aspects and situations, develop social skills, and foster leadership. They also use a flipped classroom. The use of videos by teachers and students takes place in class and at home. Students learn about a subject at home and use the face-to-face -face lesson to clarify questions and delve into the material with the teacher. And finally, they use varied technological environments. The teacher's best practice lessons, uh, excuse me, the teacher's best practice lesson descriptions to show a variety of technology environments used during the year, such as simulations, games, smart boards, work pages, videos, digital books, 3D, Google Maps, and OneNote. The diversity of tools and techniques is part of a wider understanding of the school's role. Okay. All right, so let's look at the difficulties and challenges in a paperless classroom, and then we will look at the benefits, okay? So distraction and so um, these difficulties and challenging challenges are kind are, are not just from the Maestro Tall um, research study, but I also pulled some of the general difficulties and challenges that they talked about from other research studies on the paperless classroom. Okay, so distraction and discipline problems, information overload, technological problems, and teacher concerns with underdeveloped skills. 
social reading and writing on paper. Okay. The students also expressed some frustration in regard to specific issues such as delivering online testing and writing formulas with text and numbers digitally. Younger students were significantly more positive about using iPads than older students in the same school. The level of satisfaction was not equal among students. There were gender differences found. Boys were more positive in their attitudes towards using laptops and iPads than girls. The satisfaction of students with learning in a paperless classroom decreased somewhat over time. So let's look now at the benefits of a paperless classroom and future writing implications. We will look at the research-based benefits and hopefully we can have a little discussion later on. Okay, so the benefits. Uh, again, developing a solid rationale for ideas for teaching in a paperless classroom using varied technologies and developing innovative pedagogies. Students with disabilities, especially dyslexia, benefit even more from a paperless classroom policy. They can type instead of hand write, and this tends to improve their academic performance. It can also enhance the instructor's ability to solicit active participation from all students during class. You can conduct immediate and meaningful assessment of student learning and provide needed real-time feedback and assistance to maximize student learning and enhance performance. They express a high level of satisfaction and have no desire to return to a paper system. Students experience the paperless classroom as a more personalized, interactive, effective, and enjoyable learning environment. Teaching in a paperless classroom can employ constructivist pedagogies that place students in learning at the center. Okay, so I had some outcomes uh, based on a student survey. Uh, how well do you know the four stages, excuse me, how well do you know the four stages of process writing? And how well do you know the parts of the one paragraph essay? Over half the students said I understand it well, or I understand it really well. Let's see if we can look at a student portfolio example. Uh, in South Korea, uh, very often, just culturally, students tend to do the minimum amount of work that you ask them to do. And I've personally found that it's less of a struggle to get the students to bring their work to completion with this sort of interactive open forum um writing teaching that i've been doing uh, since we started teaching online so just here's an example portfolio one after they finished their portfolio they take the final drafts from each writing okay they take all the final drafts and put them together and submit this okay that's um a leaflet All right. So future implications. Um, so for my students, um, they have a, a midterm and a final that is written where they have to write an essay. Uh, as it stands, we currently have a really clunky system, in my opinion. The students at home are expected to print out their, um, their test sheet, which has a section for a plan and then a section for the writing. They're expected to print it out and then photograph it and then upload it to the LMS, which is a nightmare. Uh, be, for one, because students have um, different quality uh, cell phone cameras. And <laughs> so anyway, um, in the future, hopefully someone develops some sort of system where the students can just type in the answers 
And if it has copy and paste detection, that will be very good. So the students aren't capable of just lifting information off the internet and just using it to pass exams. Um, website verification might be helpful because as we all know, the information available in the world is not all uh, necessarily valid, especially in an academic setting. So if students could easier find out what's um, adequate to use and what's not adequate to use, that might be helpful. Uh, time spent editing, Microsoft Word has that function so you can see like how much time a student spent working on a document that might um, be really helpful too, and duplicate copy detection so that students don't try to um, copy the work from each other. I think that that would also be extremely helpful. Okay, if education continues to go this way, but hopefully as far as writing education, uh, we can eliminate a lot of the paper use that we use as educators because um, I think that it's, it's very true that we contribute to a lot of the paper waste in our world. Okay, so maybe we can do some of these discussion questions together for the rest of the presentation. Um, number one, what strategies, software, et cetera, have you employed with teaching writing during the COVID-19 era? Part two, do you prefer teaching writing as you are now or before the pandemic hit and why? Part three, how are your students responding to the new instructional methods that you are employing in your classroom? And part four, what do you think you could do to improve your students' experiences as well as your own experiences with writing in the future? So, um, let's see. Does anyone have some, uh, maybe if you, you would like, you can copy and, or chat or type your answer. And for number one, what strategies, software, et cetera, have you employed with teaching writing during the COVID-19 era? I'd love to get some uh, feedback from you. You can start with number one. Uh, yes, I can uh, share my experience. Uh, so I teach at Resign State University. Um, and uh, we use uh, educational platform uh, Moodle. And students, uh, so they type uh, their essays, sometimes they write them and then photograph them and download into this uh, system. And then I check their essays. Uh, sometimes they download the, their essays on the forum and then uh, their classmates can see these essays and uh, we read them all together and assess them together. So we use this educational platform. And also we use social networks. Um, they sometimes download, download their essays there and we can uh, discuss them all together. So this is what we do. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> pretty much the same actually. Uh, so we do not use Moodle, unfortunately. Um, so that's St. Petersburg State University. So again, I work with uh, adults. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we use Google Docs. And what I really like about it is the possibility to share. Uh, so just in the real time mode, I can share somebody's essay uh, with the rest and just show what I would like to change there. Right, so we kind of, uh, we can discuss, for example, how it is better to change the introduction and we can change it um, so the students can see the results. So this is what I really like about Google Docs and, uh, well, about working online, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's see. So you kind of answered number two already, but uh, number two, do you prefer teaching writing as you are now or before the pandemic hit? I think many people uh, absolutely hate teaching online. Is, is there anyone here that absolutely like prefers um, the older methods or the, the newer methods of teaching? 
That's I think good. everyone knows where I stand. I, I like, I, I honestly do think this method is um, much more effective um, because learning interactively in real time uh, is, is much better uh, than having them go home and write it and then bring it back. I think you can learn much more in the class time that you have um, rather than like waiting and like getting back around to something like doing it right then I think is, is, is more effective, at, at least in teaching writing. Okay, so let's see what's next. Mm, so how are your students responding to the new instructional methods? Um, anybody? Are you, how are your students responding? Well, I can share some of my experiences. I actually teach academic writing to fourth year students and then bachelor students uh, at a university where we don't have a linguistics program. I mean, we have a linguistics program, but I teach students who are not linguists. And so I teach them research proposal writing because they are, uh, this is a requirement for them to complete the program. And I employ a tool that I actually designed together with a team of other teachers and students. Uh, and so this tool is used extensively in my classroom and what I can say about the students' experiences with the tool is that uh, most of them are quite positive about the use of the tool because they, they think that it's an innovative element that has to be brought forth in the classroom because we're now living in the age of, uh, in the digital age and the students actually believe that you have to respond to the demands of time and so you have to uh, introduce the methods that would make the learning more, you know, less standardized. They feel that this is a form of learning that allows to enrich their experiences beyond the classroom space. And so overall, I think that students are actually embracing these tools as a way for them to have wider choice, wider variety in terms of having the input, not only in traditional forms, such as print materials, but also you know, in a digitalized form. And uh, this is especially true of younger generations of students. And you were telling us that you know some students who are older tend to be more resistant toward uh, use of technology and specific writing tools, the specific tools like Google Docs. Um, and I think that that does depend on, on age a lot. But younger generations definitely, my, my, my feeling is that they definitely do react very positively and they actually welcome the use of such tools in the classroom uh, because this is, uh, this I think may increase their motivation. I conducted a survey amongst, in my, among my students who were using the tool and actually today I'm going to present this tool and talk a little bit about, about the experiences of my students with the technology tool. Uh, and they were saying that um, they, their motivation to actually practice production in the writing classroom increased uh, because they were exposed to a variety of different exercises online and the exercises provide you with a lot of, you know, with instant feedback and that helps them actually practice doing something instead of just dealing with the printed textbook, which does not push them to learn more and to practice, you know, you know working on some grammatical, some grammatical vocabulary forms. That's something that they find to be boring, this kind of a drill practice. And so whenever you expose them to tools like that, they start doing the exercises, they get, they get the feedback, and that somehow gives them a sense of satisfaction, a sense of reward in the learning process. So I think they, these are some of the benefits of using instructional technology. Of course, there are challenges. There are always challenges with using technology, including anxiety among students, including you know, technical glitches that may occur. But still, I think that in most contexts uh, where technology is really available to students, uh, the opportunities to use technology definitely outweigh, you know, the benefits of using technology out, outweigh the disadvantages. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Okay, so, what was the last question? Actually, I have some questions. To... Oh, uh, sure. I just wanted to ask some questions regarding your own experiences with using Google Docs in your classroom. But, um, sorry, I'm actually interrupting somebody, I guess. No, 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 actually. To, to, uh, <laughs> answer the questions. I, I'd love to hear your question. I just, I'm, I'm researching writing, the use of writing tools in the classroom, even though I'm more concerned about academic writing courses that specifically teach writing for research purposes. 
Uh, but overall, what I found in the literature is that uh, the use of collaborative tools is now a big trend in in writing and research and writing and a lot of uh, teachers are actually suggesting that uh, interaction patterns do play a role in uh, how uh, writing quality of students works can improve and so i was wondering if you i mean if, if you have some writing data because I've, i looked at uh, you know the data that you presented us with is more of a perceptions data because you've used a survey but i was wondering if uh, if you have some writing data if uh, you can uh, tell us a little bit about the writing uh, the increases or any learning gains in terms of students writing performance as a result of using those tools and if if there are any gains then how is that related to students uh, use of the Google Docs in their interaction patterns because some research suggests that whenever students contribute more and interact more when they work on a joint product that may contribute to the, qual uh, the increase in their writing quality and when this engagement with uh, collaborative web efforts is less evident then the progress is also more I know there's less of prog progress in their learning and their writing performance. So I, I just wonder to whether you can give us a few words about that. Thank you. Right, Thank right, you right. Oh, no problem. So right now, um, I only am really looking at the qualitative side of the, mm -hmm. the research um, because I'm actually not completely sure how to do this in a quantitative way. Mm -hmm. um, I could use the peer assessment checklist and like start counting like okay so this percentage of people the first time did this accurately this percentage of people the second time did this accurately but i'm not really sure and i don't know if anyone's done any research uh quantitative uh, oh, there are lots quantitative of studies. research based yes, like there are lots of studies on that you know, using quantitative methods to assess students' writing. There are lots of papers which I would suggest looking at in the Journal of Assessing Writing because they do use a lot of quantitative methods uh, to measure the students' gains. Um, right, right, right. By using the checklist is actually quantitative to matter as well because you get you, you come up with numbers for student right, right, right. writing, right? right. Um, so I think that's something in the future that I will do. But at first, because I mean, quite frankly, it's easier and it's easier to get permissions right now from my university or not mm -hmm. at all because it's qualitative, but mm -hmm. um, a, a quantitative approach to analyzing the data I can do in the future, but I need some um, sort of inspiration and some, some precedent in order to get an idea of how to actually do it, but sure, I'll do it. And I definitely uh, think that the outcomes will be different um, based on the, the culture that the students are in. Um, right now, if I were to quantitatively assess whether or not there are gains in my students' performance, I, I would say yes. But if I were to ask them if they prefer being in the classroom face-to-face uh, -face, or if they prefer doing it online, I, I really think that they would say they prefer face-to-face. -face. And my students are like, 18 years old to 20 years old, but mm -hmm. this is due to cultural issues, um, being that they definitely <laughs> feel more uh, accountability this way. Like it's hard to escape account accountability and responsibility when you're engaging um, interactively. Uh, it, it makes them feel uncomfortable, so they have to do it. <laughs> well, I think that is research, your research sounds like it has a lot of promise. And nowadays, uh, when it, if we talk about writing research, actually there are very few studies indeed that address the writing gains as a result of uh, teachers using technology, including collaborative tools. I think collaborative, collaborative tools and multimodal tools like the ones that you've described are actually now in high demand. And so if you continue with your research and you find a way to measure up the learning gains from your classroom using Google Docs, I think that your paper definitely could be of high interest to journals like Know, a lot of writing journals because you know from my experience consulting with the journals uh editors are actually looking for papers where they can see how you can measure writing performance because there's a huge amount of research that publishes on students performance in you know using technology tools but there, there's very little research now that concerns specifically 
uh, the students' writing progress, you know, as a result of using this, the tools, especially tools which involve interaction and collaboration in the writing space between students using like Google Docs and, you know, different platforms. Right, right. I'm sorry, could you tell me the name of that journal again so I can... Uh, it's Assessing it Writing. Assessing Writing. It specifically focuses on how you uh, assess the writing performance of students and there are, there are lots of papers. And I can actually recommend a study by uh, Zhu and Li and Zhu 2017. It's on the use of collaborative tools such as Google Docs, specifically to teach students research writing uh, proposal, uh, writing of research proposals. Uh, it's a study where they actually suggest specific way or method of measuring students' results based on the proposals that they produce collaboratively, collaboratively using in groups, sorry, working in groups uh, using Google Docs. And it's a study that was published in the famous, in another famous writing journal that publishing, uh, publishes a top research. Uh, it's called Journal of Second Language Writing, and they do publish some very, you know, some expert research on writing gains as well because they're very picky about the analysis that you can present in terms of uh, that helps you show that you've measured the writing gains and uh, the results are accurate. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I'll see what I can do. Uh, actually, I'm very lucky. Um, my my fiance is a, a physicist, so he, oh, he, said, he said that he would help me go come up with some good um, uh, data, data analyzation. I can't oh, speak anymore. That's anyway, yeah, so, you're so lucky, hopefully, you're lucky hopefully we'll see. <laughs> hopefully yeah, we can come up with something. For that. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Carla. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming to the talk. I hope that you found something useful. I, I think a lot of you are already doing something similar, so it's cool. Well, I have, we have some more time left before the end of the session, I guess. Maybe oh, some, oh. somebody has questions or comments to make. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, may I ask a technical question? <clears throat> so, Kale sure. said that it's possible to see how much time was spent on editing a document. Uh, so, am I right that you meant Microsoft Word? And, and so, if yes, so then where can I see? Um, I did, you can do that with Microsoft Word, but I, I meant like um, for some sort of um, online write, word processor that it would be nice if there was a time editing tool function. But for Word, um, if you just, hmm, that's a good question. I think you have to open Word first and then open the, click on the document or open the document, but Word needs to be open first, I believe. I, I, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I can try it, I guess. Hold on one second, let's see. Let's... Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna pause the screen share. Okay, so I'm opening it now. Let's see. Um, okay, so let's, I don't think there's any. <laughs> uh, so I have it open. Let's say if I clicked on this. I'm really sorry. I've seen it sometimes. And actually the first couple times I saw it, I was a little surprised. I was like, hey, um, I would, I'm sorry. I think maybe Google could uh, answer that like with certainty, but yeah, it doesn't appear that. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I'm sorry.
Any um, other questions? Yes. Yes, I was thinking that probably you could try the file menu maybe on top there. That, that's oh, where. Okay, let's try that. I haven't, yeah, I haven't been using a uh, word myself for a while because I, ha I have a MacBook and pages. So that's why. But I think you can find all the basic information about a, a given file in the file menu. But I feel like I've seen it just when I, as I was opening up the document. Um, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, so thank you. So I, after it's open, your document, you press file, and then on the right hand side, it's under properties. Can you guys see that? Thank you. Total editing time. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> I've never seen it actually. Okay. okay. Questions? Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your experience. I'm a relatively inexperienced writing teaching. I mean, I'm, I've been doing uh, foreign languages for a while, but writing is something I've only been doing for two semesters. So this was incredibly helpful in terms of both uh, some conceptual principles that you shared with us and some very uh, practical techniques. And I was just wondering, uh, because um, we've been doing a lot of this works and these papers in Microsoft Word and other uh, software, other platforms that actually provide students with ample opportunity to do spell checking. And also we know that uh, Word does the, the grammar checking sometimes and vocabulary will show you if some Thing is out of style basically etc so I was wondering if you think that is that is actually uh, efficient if that's a good idea to allow students uh, to, to allow the, the apps to allow the software do some background proofreading for them or if we probably should come up with uh, or well developers software developers should come up with some new apps that will allow students to do all of this work uh, like uh, totally on their own without Without any proofreading and spell checking, if you know what I mean. Right. I, I think that spell checking is okay, but I don't think that this sort of software should be the first option or the standardized option in terms of what students should use to assess their writing, because I think it would eliminate voice and style, and that's definitely something that I think is, is needed, that creativity, like Microsoft doesn't always um, correct the grammar correctly. So I, I definitely don't, it's, it's spelling for spell check, yes, for sure, but, and maybe a little bit of, um, of a suggestion, a grammatical uh, correction, a suggestion of that, but not like, as you know, letting it be set in stone because otherwise I think we will all start to sound like robots and lifeless so I think it's important to um, let this, the voice of the students remain in their writing. Yeah, thank you. I know because you know there are all uh, lots of these tools like Grammarly. Every time you go on YouTube, you have this uh, ad popping up that says you should use Grammarly. That will provide you with better style options and whatever. So yeah, so probably it's not a very good idea to use all uh, to use these kinds of tools that uh, might actually suppress the creativity of the students. Right. I, I don't ever recommend um, anything like that. I mean, I know it's available um, and I think it, it can be used casually or, or in their own time, but I would never as a instructor say, you need to check your work and use Grammarly to do it. I, I don't think that that would be helpful for them. Thank you so much. 
Mm -hmm. And I also wanted, wanted to, to uh, take this opportunity to thank you for this idea of using, in, when, when you when you shared uh, the screen with us, you showed those portfolio, student portfolio, that the checklists basically that the students have. Because we also practice uh, peer review quite a lot among our students, but I never thought of uh, using something as handy as that. So when you have a checklist, you can actually, and you can adapt, adjust that to every writing course that, that we have. Up in in every year right with every semester so so as to make uh, uh, the students work when they do peer review much easier so that is incredibly instrumental thank you for that oh you're so welcome uh, i'm sorry to interfere carla our technicians say that we are to wind up our time is over okay all right so uh let's finish up with the last part of the slide, let's see if it's not completely gone. One second. Uh, PowerPoint closed, I'm sorry. Just one second, I shouldn't be too slow. I'm sorry I didn't get a, a chance to look at the chat because we were okay. In the chat, meanwhile, in the chat, there was one uh, request whether you could share the presentation with the participants, maybe send a copy or something. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so, it's just a, a nice uh, way to wrap up things. I think it's nice to wrap up things with a quote because, um, all right, so, Infinite growth of material consumption in a finite world is an is an impossibility. Okay, so this is by E. F. Schumacher. Okay, all right. And as far as paper and paper waste is concerned, I think that this uh, predicament doesn't necessarily have to be a completely bad thing. Okay, and for sharing the um, this. Uh, presentation, you guys are welcome to send me an email here. And I will uh, forward this uh, presentation to you. Okay. And it was nice to meet all of you. And I hope y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carla, for being with us, for uh, speaking. And thank you very much, everyone, to join in and to take part. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.